Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program. I'm Barb Kane, the Museum Education Public Programs Coordinator at Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute. For those who may not be familiar, Munson Williams is a fine arts center dedicated to serving diverse audiences by advancing the appreciation, understanding, and enjoyment of the arts. To learn more about the Institute and current and upcoming program offerings, you can visit us at mwpai.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today's talk, Setting the Mood, Dramatic Lighting and Art and Theater, is presented in association with the exhibition, Astonishing Brilliance, Art, Light, and the Transformation of American Culture, which is on view through January 3rd. Our speakers today are Munson Williams Curator of 19th Century American Art, Miranda Hofelt, and Theater Lighting Director, Wayne Murphy, Jr. Wayne is a recent graduate of SUNY Fredonia with a BFA in theatrical production and design with a concentration in lighting design. Wayne grew up with a love of theater thanks to his family and his time at New Hartford High School doing mass productions and productions throughout his college years, both at NBCC and Fredonia. He has been involved in all aspects of theater from stage crew to pit orchestra and everything in between, even performing in a few shows on stage. He is currently employed as a stagehand by the Turning Stone Resort and Casino and does freelance design work around the area, currently working as a lighting director at both the Wild Rep Theater in New Hartford and the newly formed Children's Theater in Utica. In addition to astonishing brilliance, Miranda Hofelt has curated many great exhibitions in the Museum of Art Galleries, including last year's Mysterious, Marvelous, Malevolent, The Art of Elihu Vetter, and the upcoming exhibition, More Than a Tweet, Birds, Art, and Culture, which opens March 12, 2021. Following the presentation, there will be a brief Q&A, so feel free to use the chat function. And now I give the floor to Miranda. Enjoy the program. I wanted to give a big thank you to Barb and all of the museum education department for how patient and gracious they are uh, under the current circumstances with COVID-19 and, and getting these wonderful programs uh, to you virtually. So thank you so much, Barb. Um, as Barb noted, today's program is actually Wayne and I presenting a, a, a joint in, in which we're going to be at uh, the art in astonishing we see artists uh, creating art in response response to and uh, innovating on the different uh, developments in lighting technology throughout the 1800s. And uh, Wayne is really going to be looking at um, the technological innovations in theater lighting and how those changing techniques really impact the art of design uh, in amplifying um, the theatrical productions throughout the 1800s and into the 21st century. So I'm going to begin uh, to uh, set the proverbial stage, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, by giving you a brief overview of Astonishing Brilliance. And I use a shortened, uh, the shortened name of the exhibition. Astonishing Brilliance is actually a quote from an art commentator in the 1800s when he saw the first Tiffany lamp. And so I think he said it was, uh, you know, it had astonishing brilliance. And so that's the uh, impetus for the title. So um, to give you that brief of your overview, we're gonna actually start with the first slide. It should be exactly the background that you see behind me. So, um, and as, as Barb said, Astonishing Brilliance, Art, Light, and the Transformation of American Culture is on view through the 3rd of January, 2021. So I do hope that you'll come in and look at these objects up close uh, and begin to think about how artists are working. Now, the exhibition is actually uh, about developments in artificial light and new methods of lighting and how they affected how Americans perceived color depth and brightness. And that really changed uh, and transformed how Americans lived uh, throughout 
throughout time. And what we're really looking at also is um, the way in which painters and designers responded to these groundbreaking innovations in lighting technology and the changes that they brought and um, how artists really respond and incorporate those changes into their own, own work. And the exhibition is divided into three sections. Um, the first section Barb's gonna show you uh, a view of, and um, that is the uh, nighttime scene. And the second section is actually what you can see in the middle is a kind of history of those that lighting technology that's happening in the 1800s and the impact that it has on interior design and fashion design. And in the last section you see here um, in yellow, and that really looks at the ways in which you know, with the invention of artificial light, the kind of realization on the part of artists that there is something called natural light and that that changes our perception of the world. And so you move from the Hudson River School artists painting landscapes in which light is used symbolically to um, the end of the century in which American Impressionists are really the subject matter of the paintings are the shifting uh, qualities and the nature of light itself. Um, so the exhibition um, really takes as its central core point this notion of light. And the next slide that Barb is gonna show you is really the, the first image, the first painting um, that you're going to encounter when you come into the gallery. This is a picture done uh, by Narcy Virgil Diaz de la Pena, and it's called The Sorceress. And it really gives us a good sense of how terrified people were of the night in the early 1800s. Um, it's a full moon when people are out uh, because you can actually see where you're walking, there are no street lights yet. Uh, however, full moons were considered to be the most uh, the time in which the most evil creatures came out. And here we can see a witch about to curse uh, a poor, un unwitting uh, young woman. And what Diaz does here, and I want you to look closely at the moon, because he's being very specific about creating this very cold uh, temperature of the light that's emanating from the moon, this kind of, that adds to the heightened scariness of the overall image. And this uh, lighting, mood lighting, if you will, um, is really demonstrated in terms of the next painting that we're, we're going to look at, um, which is by the artist Johann Culverhaus, and it's entitled Night Market. Now, as I said, the moon, a full moon was associated with evil creatures. And in this painting, you can see the moon in the upper center of the painting. But what's mitigating it, what's uh, kind of shielding the dangerous aspects of the moon from that night market in the foreground is this cathedral. All right, so where we will begin is uh, somewhat in the same realm as what Miranda was talking about, which is going to be uh, a little bit about how um, theater lighting has changed throughout the years. Um, we start in uh, Greek amphitheaters um, where they would have play festivals all throughout the day uh, from uh, sunrise up until dusk um, where Mother Nature would become its own sort of lighting designer. Um, you know, they wouldn't be able to hold these plays at night, of course, um, and so we had, uh, again, these amphitheaters where they would house plays uh, all throughout the day. Uh, in our next slide, we move into the Globe Theater. Um, of course, this is a very modern image of the Globe, um, but it was very much the same idea at the Globe in Elizabethan times, um, where they would have plays during the day where they could be seen, uh, because again, there was no artificial lighting at the time. They would have, they would have no control over the uh, over lighting itself. Uh, as we start to move to indoor theaters, in our next slide, you can see we do have, uh, this was one of the first indoor theaters that we would actually start using candles 
uh, to be able to light the whole stage and have the space inside lit. Uh, the one issue here being when they have all these candles, of course, it's a, it's a chore to light all of them. There's hundreds of candles that would have to be lit before the performance and then extinguished afterward. And they would also uh, be lighting up the whole uh, theater as this uh, performance is going on. There is no uh, way to control really what would be lit and what would not be lit. Um, and then as we move along uh, with the invention of modern lighting, moving into gas lighting and even uh, oil lighting as needed, uh, and into today we have incandescent uh, lamps, which can be used in special lighting instruments that can be used uh, in our modern day catwalks as you see uh, here. Um, so, uh, Miranda mentioned it uh, a little while ago when she was talking about the uh, Culver House. She mentioned color temperature. Um, and what color temperature is, is how we measure light, how we see light. Um, and we have a lovely graphic here uh, on the far left of the spectrum. We have very warm color temperatures, very deep amber uh, light. Uh, these would be um, very similar to candlelight or even campfire. It's a very warm, welcoming environment. Uh, in the middle of the spectrum here, we have your modern uh, light bulbs or incandescent. Um, and then as we get up to the higher color temperatures, the cooler color temperatures, we have more uh, LEDs and we have uh, fluorescent tubes and even your compact fluorescents that would be used a lot today. What Wayne was saying about theater lighting um, and going to the theater, that's one of the things that we find with nightlife is that suddenly we have all these activities that we had to do in the day in terms of going to um, the theater. Uh, Wayne was just showing us the Greek amphitheater and also uh, the Shakespeare the Shakespearean Globe Theater. Um, but what we find in the 19th century is that suddenly this is when people can go to the theater at night because we have street lights so you can walk walk to the theater um, and the nighttime is a time for entertainments uh, nightlife and also romance and if you look at the Lux painting while well, you see this woman in white and another woman in this wonderful uh, peach colored gown, there's actually a gentleman and you can see his black leg strutting in between them. Um, so this idea of romance uh, and hanging out with a man is something also really quite different. Um, and you can go ahead, Barb, and, and move on to the next slide. Um, when we were talking about uh, the footlights and the shifting history of light that Wayne was discussing. Um, this is a color lithograph of the romantic ballet dancer uh, Fanny Elsler when she performed in New York City in uh, 1839. And as you look at her, she's actually depicted dancing on the stage. And as Wayne was discussing, um, in early lighting techniques, what actually happened was that these candlelight chandeliers were hanging from the ceiling in the auditorium as well as over the stage. And the effects of that is really captured here by this artist, because you'll see that uh, Elsler is very, uh, there's a kind of warm color that she's illuminated by, and we have overall even lighting. The only shadow that we can actually see on the stage is if you look at her uh, little um, red boots, you can see a shadow of her feet and also uh, her skirt uh, on the stage. The backdrop that you see was typically painted by a, a landscape artist of some sort. And because you couldn't have the theatrical lighting effects to, to cause a sense of depth, um, these uh, painters would actually paint shadows in to give a three dimensionality to the set. Um, this overall candlelight uh, also should instruct us or let us know that the importance of the audience checking each other out because they're fully lit as well as the performer um, is something that is very different from our um, theater experience today. And as we move forward in time by about um, 70 years, uh, Barb, if you wanna move forward on the next slide, we're looking at a pastel that was done by the artist uh, Everett Shin. 
of uh, a, of a music hall in which we see a performer uh, doing his act uh, under or actually underneath um, the footlights and their electric footlights, such as the ones that Wayne uh, was discussing a moment ago. And we can again see um, the impact of these uh, lights that are shooting up at the actor. It's really fascinating. Uh, Shin's fascinated by these lighting effects and this cold light uh, that's very different from the, the light quality that we saw on Fanny Elsler. Um, and the highlights that it picks up on um, the shins, the bottom of the of the ventriloquist's uh, top hat, um, the side of his face, and then this very strange thing that the lightest and most central part of the uh, entire pastel is really his underparts. Um, and so we can also see that the lighting in the theater has also changed. It's now the audience members are sitting in a kind of half light. And if you look over in the lower left hand corner of the pastel, you can kind of see one of the patrons who's who's not real excited by the ventriloquist. He's kind of fallen asleep, uh, but we can see him in the semi light of the image. Um, so uh, what we can see here uh, is what Wayne was talking about in terms of color temperatures, a warmer light versus a colder light, uh, and how that impacts um, our perception of the performer. And I'm going to toss it back to you now, Wayne. Thank you for your patience. So uh, another thing that uh, started to really come about uh, as we move through uh, theatrical ages, if you will, is this uh, idea that we've been talking about, about the uh, uh, stage being semi-lit uh, and areas of the audience uh, being semi-lit and we start talking about dimming. Um, on this slide, on the far on the left side of your screen, we have a very early uh, rudimentary system that would be used to, to cut off some of the candlelight that would be uh, shown on stage. Uh, just very, uh, again, rudimentary tin cans that were put on strings and pulleys that would be pulled down for the performance uh, themselves. Uh, as we move into the middle of the screen, we start seeing more uh, electric dimmers. Um, these were used to control how quickly the lights would come on uh, and even go out out after a scene. Uh, and this would also start to be used um, having different intensities of how bright the lights were on stage. Um, so this really becomes a factor in how designers start thinking about lighting. Uh, do they want to, to end the scene with a very quick blackout? Or do they want the lights to fade out kind of slowly? Or do they want these lights to be at different levels? Um, and as we move into more modern boards, which you can see on the right here, everything becomes digital. Everything is a lot easier to control, where with the uh, lighting panel in the middle here, you would have um, operators with two by fours of pieces of wood strung across these levers uh, that they would have to use to dim these lights all at the same time, or even have operators with both hands and even a foot uh, trying to dim these all at the same time. Uh, and as we move forward onto our next slide, uh, we can see some advancements that would be made in theater. Um, starting with our uh, light on the left here, this is what's called a parkan. Um, you might notice this from rock concert uh, rigs. Uh, this was this became the workhorse for rock concerts. Um, so all, this was also used in the theater quite a lot. Um, this particular light uh, is what we call a wash light, and it throws light everywhere across the stage. There's no real control over where it goes except for the yoke on it, where you can uh, point it, where you need it. Um, and as we move forward in the middle here, we see more advancements being made, and we are able to have more of these what are called profile lights, where you can cut down the light very specifically. Uh, either onto a certain set piece or even to a specific actor as needed. Um, both of these two lights use incandescent light bulbs. They have that very warm color temperature, that white light, that uh, amber uh, tone to it. Um, and then on the right, we have an LED fixture, uh, which of course uses uh, diodes, red, green, and blue diodes to emit that white light. 
light uh, that we know. But this light would be a lot cooler in its color temperature. It'd be a lot more blue tinted to it. Um, and when we need it to produce different colors in the first two lights, we have what are called gels, uh, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, but with the LED, of course, we can have any color that we want without having to switch anything up. Um, and in our next slide, we can start talking about gels, which of course uh, produce colors on. Uh, oftentimes, these are referred to as color filter media, uh, and they are um, they started off as glass discs that would go in front of the light uh, to produce that color on stage, and to uh, in modern times they become these plastic uh, sheets that we would have that we could actually use on stage to produce different colors as needed. Um, another thing that came about with uh, rock concerts, and it's used a lot in theater, musicals, and even dance uh, that we see on our next slide is the uh, spotlight. Um, the spotlight has been, again, used in rock concerts. It's used in theater, used in dance. I mean, it's used a lot to highlight where you want the most attention drawn. For rock concerts, of course, it's on the main singer, even on soloists. Uh, we use it a lot in the same way in theater, to focus attention to one certain area. Pull your attention here, look here, this is important. Um, or to highlight a little bit of action that's going on. And we have a beautiful comparison on our next slide between um, an etching and a dance piece that I did a couple years ago out at uh, SUNY Fredonia. Yeah, uh, uh, Wayne, and thank you for that. Um, you're looking at an etching done um, in the early 1900s by the artist John Sloan. It's an etching of the woman who really innovated modern dance, Isadora Duncan. And this really demonstrates the fascination that artists had with the effects of the spotlight and the drama that they cast. Um, so what we find Sloan doing here is really um, using a modern lighting technique with a modern etching technique to depict a modern dancer. And the wonderful aspect uh, that Sloan really plays up here is the contrasts of dark and light and the way in which those contrasts really flatten out uh, the picture and push Isadora Duncan more towards uh, the viewer, so to speak. And he's also really fascinated with the way of immersing her in this brilliant light, which immerses everybody else in the audience in complete blackness. And of course, by this point, uh, we have you know, we've gone from the audience fully lit in the early 19th century to this dim lighting uh, by mid to late 19th century to finally with the spotlights uh, and uh, the more innovative lighting technologies of theater, the audience being completely, literally in the dark. Um, and as you look at this comparison between uh, the uh, lighting techniques, um, that Wayne designed in the lighting techniques uh, that Sloan is so fascinated with, you'll note that the spotlight is a means of just really intensifying and amplifying the drama of both the etching and the three-dimensional performance. And I think Wayne's gonna talk a little bit more about the ways in which uh, lighting really impacts our experience of the performance as viewers. Yes, um, and then our next slide, we do have uh, such, a, such an example. Um, here we see uh, some textures or uh, what we call gobo being used uh, on the stage and even across some uh, exhibits throughout some different um, areas here. Uh, gobos are typically used to produce textures on stage. Uh, we use them to help set the scene. Uh, as you can see, we have some lovely uh, foliage gobos on the right here that are used. Uh, and they can often be used to create a little more depth on stage, uh, to blur things out. Um, and it's a lovely tool to be able to use to help set um, the setting as needed um, throughout different uh, productions that we have. 
Um, and in our next slide, uh, I'm going to start uh, diving into a little bit more about uh, how I use lighting in my uh, productions and what I can do to really help um, set the mood and uh, create a setting for the play. Um, so in our first couple of images here, we have uh, pictures from a production I did from The Grapes of Wrath out of SUNY Fredonia. Um, and we see uh, a perfect example of how lighting can be used uh, to help um, uh, the setting uh, for the play. On the left side, we see a wide open space that is very brightly lit. Uh, this was the one of the opening scenes of the show, which is set in Oklahoma. A great breath, of course, being uh, set in the Great Depression uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, and it's about a family that leaves their home and they travel across the country to California for hopefully greener pastures. Um, so for this uh, first image, uh, it's very harsh lighting, very, um, you know, very bright. Um, and we see another one of my tools uh, that we can use, which we call selective visibility. Uh, for this scene, the whole stage is lit because everything going on on stage is very important. We want people to pay attention to what's going on. But on the in the right image, uh, we can see that uh, there are two cast members that are highlighted downstage right. Everybody else in the scene is kind of dimly lit. Um, so the action is focused downstage right. That's, of course, where we want the audience's attention. Pay attention here. Uh, everybody else on stage is important, but you really want to focus down on what's going on downstage right in that scene. Um, and in the next slide, we can see uh, our difference in nighttime here. Uh, we go from a very beautiful daytime scene, very bright, very uh, unforgiving light, and then we move into a sunset scene, and now we have a uh, full nighttime. Uh, nighttime here, uh, again, very different in uh, uh, California where this will be taking place. Again, we see that selective visibility coming into play. Um, in the left side here, we have uh, a relative of the family, um, having his own scene with uh, their uh, lost child, newborn lost child. Uh, and in the background, we can see the family and the mother Rosa Sharon dealing with that loss. And then on the right side, we see again, that fully lit stage, uh, but this time the relative is in darkness because again, the action is uh, taking place with the whole family dealing with the news about the lost child. Um, and in the next image, we see uh, a couple of pieces from one of my favorite collections by one of my favorite artists uh, that Miranda is going to speak about. Now, just as a, a as a side, this is uh, these are two uh, from uh, Thomas Cole's signature Voyage of Life uh, that's here at the uh, Munson Williams Proctor. And I should point out these are not in the exhibition. You need to go upstairs uh, to check them out. But what I did wanna tap into here and kind of piggyback on with Wayne's use of light uh, for uh, dra drama within the image and also to guide uh, the viewer through an image, we can see that Cole, even though this is 1839, is very much interested in the dramatic use of light uh, to kind of move us through the picture. And so if you look on your left-hand side of the screen uh, at the Voyage of Life Manhood, um, this is the moment of deep trauma in which we can see uh, this figure in a boat uh, in rushing water that's a, and he's about to hurdle over uh, the rapids of the waterfall. In the foreground on the right is a blasted tree we can see stormy uh, weather um, through these rough, craggy rocks. Um, and then in the upper uh, left-hand corner, we can see this little circle of light with this guiding uh, divine figure. Uh, it, it seems to be watching over him from a distance, but it's unclear what's gonna happen. So this is a very, what we would, what people in the 1830s would have called a very sublime painting where we can see um, the, the terrifying aspects of the divine. 
If we move over to the right-hand side of the screen, which is Voyage of Life Old Age, uh, we can see that the figure has made it through the rapids of life and is floating upon calm waters. Uh, there is this amazing contrast between dark and light in the picture. Um, and lightness seems to be breaking through the darkness rather than the, the storm about to hit the, the man in manhood. What I also want to point out about this dramatic use of light is when we go back up to that left-hand corner of the picture, we see this brilliant glowing light um, and these rays coming down uh, with a dove in the midst of it. Uh, so right between, the dove is almost right in the center of the entire composition. And in the 19th century, these rays that you see piercing through the clouds were called God rays. And so they're representative of a divine light, uh, another worldly light, another world that uh, is being promised at the end of life. And I think that this otherworldly uh, quality uh, and the use of light to uh, symbolize uh, something divine or otherworldly is also something that is used quite a bit in um, theatrical lighting. So I'm gonna, I think Wayne is gonna talk about that a, a little bit uh, in his next series of slides. Uh Yes. So in our uh, in our first image here, I'm going to dive a little bit more into uh, one of the um, fundamentals that I always talk about uh, with my director whenever I start a new show. Um, and that is um, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, when we are working on a show, everybody from the props artisan up to the uh, lighting designer up to the actors on stage and director are all trying to breathe life into this uh, world of the play and tell a story. Um, so one of the things I always ask my director about when we start a show is um, what kind of lighting, uh, what kind of show is this going to be? What kind of world is it? Is it going to be a little more realistic or is it going to be more presentational? Um, and what that means is when we have a realistic show, um, things are going to be very matter of fact. Um, take the Grapes of Wrath, for instance. It's a very matter of fact show. Lighting is very realistic. Um, they are a family that's living in Oklahoma, and then they move to California. The lighting is going to convey that in, uh, in what I do on stage. Um, but when we move into a show like this, which you're seeing now, uh, this was a show I did at SUNY Fredonia called Antigone. Um, and what we wanted to do here was we wanted to do kind of a combination of realistic and presentational for that play, for the story we were telling. Uh, the realistic parts would be an Antigone living out her, her world, her life, uh, trying to bury uh, her brother, trying to get uh, retribution for him, trying to make sure he gets it's a proper burial. Uh, and the presentational parts are more when we move into uh, this world we had called Dream Time, uh, where the narrator, the uh, Greek chorus, would come in and describe what happened in the scene before and then what was going to happen in the upcoming scene. Um, and for these moment in this world, we wanted things to, we wanted to break reality and we wanted to make uh, the narrator's own reality. Uh, so for this, I used very deep, saturated colors, and I bathed the whole stage in this color, in these colors, to make sure the audience knew this is not reality. This is its own separate world that we're stepping into where this narrator is going to come and talk to us. And we see, again, the use of a spotlight to focus the attention on the narrator, highlight her and make sure the audience knows, pay attention here and to what she is saying. Um, in our next series of images, uh, we have a uh, show I was working on out at Fredonia High School, um, which unfortunately has been postponed uh, because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, this show was Carousel. 
Um, this was a beautiful show to work on. It's one of my favorite shows. Um, and in, in these two images, we see a very presentational world. Carousel itself is very presentational. Um, in the left-hand image, we have the Carousel Waltz prologue, um, where everything is being told about the story. The story is being set up through movement, through dance. Um, so it's its own kind of reality where nothing is really set in stone. So I can have a can do things a lot differently. Um, and we can see uh, we have a very heavy side light coming in that's sculpting the actors, um, which is another tool we have, um, making sure that the actors um, either pop from the set where we use that modeling light. We kind of sculpt the actors, make them look more three dimensional. Or at times we want to flatten them out, make them look more two dimensional. Um, all depends on the uh, show we're working on. And with Carousel, with the opening, we were able to break a lot of those rules, have a lot more color, um, and really be able to highlight movement of what's going on on stage. And in the right side image here, we have the Starkeeper scene. Uh, harkens back to the uh, God rays that Miranda talked about with this heavenly light coming in, highlighting uh, the Star Keeper and Billy Bigelow in this scene. Um, and in our next slide, we have a, uh, we go back to that dance piece that I did a couple years ago out at Fredonia, um, where we can talk about spotlights again, but we can also talk about angles and how important angles are and how impactful just a solo, a single source of light to be. Um, for this piece, it was a very dramatic piece about uh, somebody's day-to-day -day life and everything that's going on inside their head. So this final solo was everything coming to a head. Uh, so I wanted to really highlight what's going on in this person's mind as they're going through day-to-day -day before they have to reset. Um, I decided to really highlight that with that solo source of light um, and really uh, kind of flatten them out um, as they're going through this um, uh, the solo piece. Well, thank you, Wayne. Um, I, I want to thank you uh, specifically for this wonderful presentation. And we're going to conclude uh, again with this uh comparison between uh, Wayne's artistry and John Sloan's artistry. Um, and I hope that we've brought you a, a richer sense of how two-dimensional artists, uh, they're, they're uh, multifaceted and historically shifting uh, responses to these new lighting technologies uh, relate to how theater lighting uh, designers like Wayne uh, are in fact artists of light. And uh, I, I do want to remind you uh, that Wayne's next production is uh, for the Uticus, uh, Uticus Children Theater, uh, their production of the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, uh, which is a mouthful. And uh, Barb is actually going to post a link uh, to the chat. So if you're interested in finding out more about um, the, is it a musical, Wayne? Yes. It, it, about the musical, uh, you certainly can. And uh, another plug for my show in, that opens on the 12th of March, more than a tweet, uh, Arts, Birds, uh, Art, Birds and Culture. Um, it's a very intimate uh, one gallery exhibition that really looks at our fascination from, with birds from the 1800s forward. Um, and now if we have a bit of time, um, we're more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have for Wayne and I. And Bar Barb, I think, is going to be the facilitator of the, of the question. So feel free to uh, enter them into chat or unmute yourself. Um, the first question that we had actually was during the presentation. At some point, would you please pronounce and explain the word chiaroscurist and how it might pertain? Uh, chiaroscuro, chiaroscuro, actually. Okay. Um, if you think of cappuccino, chiaroscuro is a similar uh, a sound to it, uh, both Italian words. And uh, chiaroscuro is about the contrast of dark and light. Um, it's typically 
associated uh, with Caravaggio um, in terms of the origination of it. And again, um, that's going to be in, uh, during um, the Italian Renaissance uh, when we first see the shift to oil painting and, and Caravaggio is really playing around with uh, the way in which you can build up darks and lights to create these dramatic effects. And certainly that's what American artists uh, in the 1800s are, are very aware of all of the art schools uh, and artistic training uh, certainly uh, brought that as um, an aspect. And even the god rays that you saw in um, uh, the Voyage of Life Old Age that Thomas Cole is using is something that um, is very much a play upon that Charles Bureau effect. Okay, here's a question for Wayne. Uh, which is the stage that you showed to talk about candlelight? Was that designed after ancient Roman ruins were discovered? Um, that stage, uh, I'm not entirely sure of the name. I really wish I knew and wish I had more time to research that before I put it in. Um, but I know that was uh, designed in the early 16th in the early, what was that? 16th. Barbara Kane, that was my question. Mary Murray? Yes. Um, there's something called, uh, something like Scanne Franz or something. And these um, ancient Roman ruins were uh, like theater sets. And uh, it looked a lot like that to me, like in North Africa and where Turkey is now, as well as Rome to the uh, far corners of the empire, they had these um, theaters, I guess, and they looked a lot like that particular one that you showed. Thank you, Mary. Any, any other questions? Interesting, thank you all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. All right, thank you so much for your time and attention and joining us. Have a wonderful day and have a wonderful week, everybody. Thanks, Barb. Thanks. Thank you. Take okay. care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Miranda and Wayne. Thanks.